So essentially, uh, what I want to share with you today is uh, things we observed uh, investing uh, in a lot of IoT startups around the world um, and uh, some trends that came out of it. So um, just a kind of quick view here. This is view of Shenzhen. I don't know if any of you visited Shenzhen so far. A few people, raise your hand. Yeah, just a few. So if you've been there, depending on what year, uh, maybe it was looking like a fishing village or it was looking like a giant city uh, with uh, 200 skyscrapers. So it's, um, it's changed a lot and it's become the, the epicenter of, uh, of IoT innovation. Um, not because the, these things are necessarily invented there, but because things are, are become real there. Uh, so um, just like I was saying in the introduction, so quick, quickly about myself. So I've been working in China, in Beijing, in Shenzhen, and more recently in, uh, in Hong Kong for about seven years, in Asia about 16 including four in Japan, still doing okay with my Japanese. I checked last night at uh, in Izakaya. Um, and um, I work with startups from around the world. Um, I'm an angel investor. I speak in lots of tech events, so I get to see the trends, the startups from, uh, from everywhere, and uh, I like to share ideas. So quickly about what Hacks is. Um, essentially, we're an investment company. Uh, we're part of a group called SOSV, uh, which is a 250 million global fund. And the hacks branch of it is focused on hardware investments. So hardware uh, apparently is not a term that's too familiar for people outside our industry. People talk more about IoT probably. That only performs better in email invitations also. And, um, um, but uh, as, you, as you will see, it covers really many, many sectors, including things that don't necessarily look like it's too IT or are connected initially. We also invest in software. We have another branch called Chan Accelerator to do that, and uh, uh, something called wetware, which is synthetic biology. Uh, synthetic biology is more about making things like uh, meat without cows, uh, egg white without chicken, and it sounds a little bit scary at first, but when you realize that what's being used is actually just a culture of animal cells, this is actually the cleanest way to produce this rather than you know, pump, pump up animals with antibiotics and feed them whatever. So uh, it's a very interesting uh, field, but I'm not going to talk about that today. That's not my branch. Um, so what we do at Hacks, um, our mission is to help startups go from very early prototype, kind of lab style prototype, to scaling a business, uh, to do it better, faster, and cheaper. The first steps of prototyping, you probably heard, uh, gone a lot cheaper these days uh, for hardware. You have a lot of prototyping platforms like Raspberry Pi, Arduino, uh, BeagleBone, and some others. You have 3D printing, you surely have heard of, that allows you to create form factors very easily. And then you have Kickstarter, the crowdfunding platform that allows you to launch products and show them to the world even before they, they're ready or even before you have the money to make it. And helps you uh, potentially get there. So those are really interesting developments of, a, of early stage uh, of um, uh, let's say new tools to build products um, and in a way it's similar to what happened in terms of uh, kind of transition from the in the first wave of the internet where you still had to set up your servers and then suddenly went to cloud and then you, you kind of um, lost an order of magnitude in terms of cost for, for getting you know startups off the ground and that's kind of what's happening these days with IoT. Uh, the other interesting aspect of it is that it's it's covering now so many industries. So I don't know if you're familiar with this gentleman. Maybe some of you know him if you're like deep in the IT field. Uh, so this is John Chambers, former CEO of Cisco. And he was giving one of his final talks before retirement and he was saying to his very large audience that about 40% of the companies in the room would probably be irrelevant within 10 years. And the reason for that was that IT is getting everywhere, not just with systems and communication, but also with with objects and tools and connected devices. It's entering literally every industry. And either you take note of that and you make use of that and you leverage it, or they're gonna be irrelevant. So uh, as investors in hardware startups, we're kind of part of the problem and part of the solution. Uh, we're part of the problem because we're trying to disrupt a whole lo lot of things. Um, we invested in over 100 startups so far. Um, about half-half B2C and B2B. We have teams coming from lots of places, including uh, so Stanford, MIT, Berkeley, Carnegie Mellon, others. Um, and uh, we're very selective. We select about 3% of the applicants. So we see about 1,000 startups every year. We invest in 30. And uh, we help them uh, you know, get to market. So our first branch, uh, historically, uh, is the branch in Shenzhen. 
where we have about 40 startups we bring uh, every year to help them accelerate their development. Then for scaling, we have another branch in San Francisco. And uh, we just launched a partnership uh, with uh, BMW in New York about smart cities and urban technologies. This year, we're going to do an extra 100 investments. We're actually doubling our entire number of uh, historical um, startup numbers in, in just one year this year. And at the group level, we're going to invest in over 200 startups um, this year. So um, I mentioned in the, um, the introduction about the talk uh, that we try to develop a methodology we call Lean Hardware. So if you're familiar with startups, maybe you learned about the Lean Startup. It's kind of how can you get to market, find customers, and first avoid building something people don't want, so you waste your time, and then how can you scale fast. So we're trying to find a way to do that with hardware. So moving atoms, it's a bit harder than, than moving bits. Um, so making sure you build the right thing a product people will want for sure to buy at the right price is, is really important uh, from the get-go. Otherwise, you might waste two years of your life on a lot of money. Uh, building things right is also really important. Even if you have the right idea and you think people want your thing, uh, the question is, can you make it with the right components, with the right supply chain? And, and last, can you make it fast enough? Because uh, the market doesn't wait. Um, so in terms of how things evolve in terms of categories of products, um, over time we saw that there were kind of five broad categories. One was lifestyle. So you have products like wearables, smart home devices. Those are the ones you mostly hear about as regular people. Um, then there's health devices. You hear some of it, uh, wellness devices, sports devices, environment-related uh, connected devices, medical devices, then robotics. Service robots, personal robots, education robots, entertainment robots. There's lots of robots. Infra type of thing, so smart city plays, mobility solutions, uh, for example, like connected bike sharing or things like that. Agriculture technology as well, like sensors in the field. And uh, last is uh, changes in the manufacturing and prototyping. So new tools to make things at small or large scale. So I'll give some examples and I'll also throw in a few like, uh, key, key words on potentially uh, future successful buzzwords uh, if things go well. So lifestyle, you have you had devices that could track you, but they don't really coach you. So the next generation is going to be, we think, coachware. Things that really guide you toward progress, not just tell you how you're doing. Um, beauty tech, home growing for food and uh, all sorts of things. Um, I won't go into details, but let's say we have a, a team from San Francisco. Uh, then health, things like pre precision medicine, uh, therapeutics. So basically devices that heal you as you're wearing them. Implantables, not just wearables. Robots as a service, as a new business model, where you don't buy the robot, you just rent the robot like you hire somebody. In infra, uh, microcomputing, apps, running apps on things, because once you have computers into things, you can run apps on things. So I'll, I'll detail what that means. Precision agriculture, uh, save resources on tools, things like micro factories and precision production. So precision is kind of one of the key words is personalized and uh, refined use of resources and analysis of behaviors. Uh, so why Shenzhen? Uh, it's pretty, pretty obvious for those of you who've been there or, or read, read the news about uh, what, what's going on in China. Uh, first, the world's capital of electronics. They now have the best resources and know-how. Uh, like some people talk about the lost art of injection molding that is now being, you know, redeveloped in China, uh, taken even further than it's ever been. Um, there's a, but the image of, of China is generally an image of, a, of cheap and low quality. And this has to be updated because, of course, first, well, China makes you know, these sort of things. Uh, but also because what really matters is beyond cost is the speed. China works at startup speed. You order things in the morning, get them in the afternoon. If they're not right the first time, you'll get them you know, a few hours later right. Um, and what's the real benefit for startups um, and for large companies that if you spend time there to develop products, in basically a week of time, you can do a month of work. Um, that's not just me saying it. It's startups joining us from Silicon Valley telling us that. Um, and essentially, if you talk about Silicon Valley, it's, it's kind of interesting to think that actually the silicon has more or less moved out of Silicon Valley, at least now in Shenzhen. 
So the idea is that, okay, silicon is in Shenzhen, but there's ideas everywhere, and you might come from wherever, uh, where you have access to a particular ecosystem, particular resources. So the idea is really, how can you combine all those resources? Resources from where you are, resources in Shenzhen, or resources in Silicon Valley. Because the key for entrepreneurs is not you know, to have everything in the first place, is to find those resources, and use the best, the one, best ones they can find. Um, so the tough part of doing all this is that Things are moving faster and faster. Yesterday's innovations are today's commodities. Uh, products like this they were considered sort of innovative just even two years ago. Today, pretty much commoditized. This is kind of flying Bluetooth speaker, levitating commodity today on the market. Uh, uh, like toy drones, VR headsets, even those things um, that people barely know how to name them until already a commodity. So this is really a big problem because that means that the bar for being relevant on the market is, is getting higher and higher in terms of, of you know, uh, technology. And you have big companies such as Xiaomi, the smartphone giant from China, um, whose founder is here, Mr. Lei Jun, um, is basically kind of part of the problem because they pick some interesting pro product companies and they say, okay, we're gonna make you the champion. They invest in them, they give them massive distribution, drop the price, and they do kind of a power play. And that worked really well for them uh, to do kind of high-speed commoditization, uh, su such as what they've done with smartphones, but also this activity tracker, uh, which costs barely $15, or this action camera, which compares very well with a, a GoPro for a third of the price. So this is you know high-pressure environment, really, for startups. And sometimes a little bit disheartening, because there's this idea that you, know, you have to be innovative, and the more innovative you are, the better the returns will be. And this, this idea that this is valid for everywhere. But what we observe that in China, it doesn't really work in a, in a straight line like, like could be like this. Um, China, most, it's more like this. You can get very high returns with limited innovation. Um, and if you're familiar with the term Shanghai, so what's kind of a, the creative copycat um, has now evolved into an art form where basically you have really high quality com products that become commodities very fast. Um, so that's kind of the environment we're in and uh, almost wondering whether uh, soon we should maybe look at China and try to learn something uh, going from copy to China, which was kind of the Chinese model, to to copy China. And that, that was kind of the cover of Wired just, uh, just a, few, a few weeks ago. Um, this is an example uh, pretty clear of how something that's still considered really innovative, in fact, that people have barely heard about a year or two years ago uh, is no commodity. Um, there's, like, there's not even a brand that's known for being the leader in that space. It's just people don't even know who invented it. So that's kind of the low end commoditization. And then there's also innovation. Uh, DJI is a very famous drone company. It's Chinese. And uh, now what's interesting is that there's this American company um, called 3 Robotics that's also doing drones that trying to become like DJI. And they say that on top of that, before you could be kind of a maker, on a bit of a hobbyist, and try to build your thing, take your time. You could, you could take six years to build a company, and today you have six months. So there's more and more gap between the, the maker movement and the hobbyist that typically go in maker fairs and, uh, and startups. Uh, it has to do also with customers' expectations, um, such as, uh, you know, uh, these type of expectations. Uh, they want basically everything, and even when you give it to them, not necessarily convinced, right? Um, so the challenge is to make something that's really an order of magnitude better, so 10 times better or very different. So how can you do that? Um, there's kind of three ways. Uh, either you go on the science side, uh, you've done research, and you invented something, you discovered something that can use that's proprietary uh, with physics, with material science, with medicine, with biology. Or it can be with software, it's particularly true for robotics, uh, where you have algorithms, AI, big data, UX, uh, those are differentiating things with software. On, in some cases, community can be a big differentiator as well. Uh, community of users that feedback data that helps you improve your product, or developers that would contribute code. So those are, those are possibilities. But I said most of the big companies are actually a little bit paralyzed, so they're kind of hiding. Uh, they're trying not to see all, the, all those changes, um, whereas there are really our opportunities, and I'll go into examples now. Um, so the great part is that a lot of things have gone really 
much cheaper thanks to smartphones. There's like about 10 different sensors in average smartphone today. And that has helped make them a commodity, really, really cheap. Also, smartphones provide connectivity to almost everything. So it's, it's very convenient to create now connected products because everybody has a smartphone. So to give some examples in the health category, um, some of our, all the startups we invested in, for instance. Um, so this one is a, a sitting tracker. Um, it looks kind of a little bit of a toy, but in fact, it's kind of a medical grade sensor that gets your entire heart wave rate waveform. And based on that, it's kind of medical, like similar to what you get when you get in a hospital pinched by a you know, little device to, to get your ECG. Thanks to that, um, they can calculate your stress level and also your kind of sedentary health, which is probably where you know, sitting is what people do most of the day, uh, not really running around and counting steps. So that's um, based on a very interesting innovative technology and that goes into the wellness uh, type of thing. Another device I wanted to introduce called Zenso, um, it's an uh, um, anxiety tracker and it feeds back to you the, the, um, your heart rate and thanks to your heart rate variability also helps evaluate your, your level of anxiety. And that actually trains you, thanks to that biofeedback, to manage your, your state of mind and to control your heart rate. So this is one example of, of those therapeutics where basically they train you to kind of heal yourself to the point that down the road, you don't need the device because you're, you're trained, you have this new superpower. Um, another device that's also kind of a, um, heading toward uh, the precision medicine or kind of a mobile hospital approach is a um, basically personalized blood testing device. Uh, initially for diabetics, but later we'll be able to track about 50 blood markers with one drop of blood. So you could have that at home and, you know, test. Uh, if you're diabetic, of course, you need to test frequently. But even, let's say you train for a marathon, you want to keep track of your blood markers, you can do it. So those are really, really interesting uh, evolutions. I'll give a few examples on the lifestyle products. Um, this is a security device. Um, basically, most of the security systems in the house use cameras. And those are pretty invasive. People are a bit sensitive about that, with a reason. And um, this one uses sound and air to track what's going on. And because it does onboard processing, it's not sending any of recorded sound. It just recognize events, such as a door, uh, a slamming door, or a, brick, or a broken window. It can also recognize if there's a fire, if there's smoke, if there's all sorts and what's interesting is not only the utility on the user side, but also thinking that this could impact um, insurance. Because with internet, essentially, we basically got the internet for free thanks to advertising. The reason we have free search, the reason we have free email, is because you know, Google acts as a middleman for advertisers. Um, advertisers pay for our eyeballs. We are the product, essentially. But for IoT, there's atoms and they have a price and people are not necessarily going to buy everything. But it's very interesting to think that insurance might play a big role in the spread and adoption of IoT. Uh, to give you a few examples that are a bit more out there, can you guess what that is? Take a guess. What could, you said? Composting. Composting, almost. But not quite. <laughs> Creating fuel, sort of, sort of. You said? No, okay. So this is actually, uh, it looks like a filing cabinet, uh, <laughs> but it's actually an insect farm for the house. So you can grow edible insects, which is already enjoyed by billions of people, not in the West, um, and considered by the United Nations as one of the futures of food, because uh, you know, soon will be nine billion people and factory farming doesn't, you know, has their own problems. So uh, you can grow your own wheel worms. They're much smaller than this one. Um, quite delicious. Um, and uh, it's basically the cleanest source of proteins you can find. Because about 25, 30% protein and you feed, feed them new kitchen scraps. So how much cleaner can you go? Um, so that's uh, one of the projects we invest in as well. Uh, give you an ex a few examples of robotics. Those tend to be pretty kind of Spectacular. Um, maybe you saw that one that went around the internet. Anyone, anyone saw this one before? No? Yeah. So the video should start. There you go. So they invented bullying, essentially. Um, so you have this poor robot just trying to do his job. 
on this bearded guy is just preventing the robot from working. Um, so a couple of things that are really interesting about this is first, the empathy. <laughs> Second, this is an untethered robot. It's not, you know, very often they're kind of hanging or being you know, held uh, um, up because they can't really be on their own. This one is entirely autonomous. But what's even more interesting is that this is an amazing piece of technology. Google bought it, and now they want to sell it because they don't know what the hell to do with it. It was really expensive, it was really high tech, but it's so far, it's so expensive and so far from being marketable that they want to sell it a few years after buying it. So this is generally, what's interesting is that this corresponds very much to the image of robotics, the way we've been trained to think about, you know, humanoid robot trying to do things like humans, but it just doesn't work because it's too expensive, even, even for Google, right? So the type of robots that tend to um, work better are those doing more specialized jobs and uh, much lower costs, such as this one. Just a bit of classical music. So you probably heard of drones as delivery vehicles. Um, the problem of drones is that they're flying with heavy stuff above your head. It's the main problem, in fact. Um, this one doesn't need to fly. It's more like a self-driving car for the pavement that can deliver things. And also, it's a lot easier to navigate on private campuses or uh, locales, basically. So this is a team from MIT that just uh, came up um, with this, uh, this device. What's interesting is that when they joined us, they had basically a modified wheelchair. And three, four months later, they had this, thanks to the speed of Shenzhen. Another example to show how robots can do a lot of really interesting but boring jobs, um, there's this one, also classical music. Robots love classical music. Um, so this one is working in supermarkets. It's doing inventory. Just going around, it's not even talking to anyone. You know, it's just doing an inventory job. In about 30 minutes, does the job of 30 hours of humans with paper and pen or tablets. Other interesting aspect is to think that devices that were not robots can become robots. So you know the Roomba is the most popular consumer robot, um, but it's not great to clean uh, big spaces such as commercial spaces, warehouses. It doesn't really work. Airports you would need like hundreds of Roombas and they're very stupid. They bump around. They don't really know where they're going. So that's a problem. Um, so what's happening in big spaces, generally you have a human pushing a machine. On the, Value add of the human is not great, but you still need one. Um, so the idea here is you have those machines, can you make them into robots? And that's exactly what, what one of our teams did. And what's interesting is that they bought a machine, they modified it, and then they went back to the factory they bought it from, and they said, look at what we've done. And the Chinese factory uh, was like, oh, that's interesting, because I have lots of competitors making machines, but if I can be the only one making a robot, then I have more of a future. So that's also possible thanks to the ecosystem of, of thousands of factories you have in Shenzhen. Another interesting robotic thing, um, so no classical music for once. Um, robotic arms is what people think also about when they think of robots. So humanoid, we saw mostly relevant. Robotic arms are used in factories and they're very expensive, typically hundreds of thousands of dollars. More recent startups have tried to make them for about 20,000. Those guys are making a high, preci high precision robotic arm for $2,000. So when you have a robot that costs so little and can do so much, it's almost difficult to imagine where you could use it because it's the price of a laptop. You could make cakes, you know. Um, <laughs> So it's really, really interesting to see that there, there are really some game changes um, that are coming to market um, very soon. Uh, another game changer in the infrastructure um, space is this thing uh, called CHIP. It's a, basically a microcomputer for $9. So it's a price, uh, what do you get for $9? You get a bento, right? Like a two Yoshinoya Gyudon or something. Um, so, the, the processor is a one gigahertz CPU, you have RAM, you have flash memory, you have Wi-Fi, Bluetooth. So 
it's a computer in the sense that you could use it as a personal computer. You could plug, you know, keyboard and mouse and screen, and you could go on the internet and do your email and watch YouTube. But you could also put this into almost anything you want for really, really cheap and make it a connected device. So those are some really interesting, uh, I think, um, game changers. Um, another interesting aspect I'd like to touch upon is that, uh, okay, there's all those startups trying to do those crazy things, but uh, as you probably know, most startups actually fail. And why do they fail? Um, first, they fail because maybe they don't have a good team, uh, sometimes because they don't have a good prototype, but imagine they clear that. They have a prototype, it works, they have a good team. They check that people actually want their thing. They check that the price is right. They still have a lot of risk because they're not sure they can make it because they're not sure they can, make, uh, they can find the right partners. Uh, they're not sure they can secure the right supplies. They're not sure they can get visible. Uh, what's the, the sound of a startup building a robot in a forest, right? Um, they're not sure they can get distribution. Maybe they cannot finance inventory because you, know, you need to pay for the atoms, right? And then uh, if all this takes too much time, maybe they're just too slow to market. So this is great opportunity, in fact, because this is what corporates are actually good at. That's what corporates have. Um, there's many ways for corporates to work with startups. Um, they could be sponsors, like support the startup in the early stages, just to keep an eye on them and see what happens. They could be partners, um, either license their own technology to the startups or license in some of the startup technologies or be the first customers. Um, they could invest, obviously. They could uh, learn how to spin off from startups to learn how how to operate uh, in the early stages, and they could acquire, of course, uh, some of them. A great example of that is what uh, happened, I think, about a week ago, um, where General Motors bought uh, this company called Cruise that is doing self, basically self-driving technologies for the aftermarket. And they paid a billion dollars for it. And the company is, what, four years old? So this is um, really a sign of a, of things to come. Uh, we've done a few cooperations with, uh, with corporates. Uh, I'll give a couple of examples. Um, so you're familiar with Onkyo, probably. So it's a Japanese high-end audio brand. They also own uh, the Pioneer brand. And uh, we've worked with them because we had a few startups doing audio products. But the, the focus of the startup was not the audio part. The focus was something new. So for example, this company called Cocoon from the UK created a headphones, a pair of headphones that you can sleep with. It basically tracks, not only has very low profile so that you can you know, roll on the pillow if you want, but also uh, it has been brainwave sensors that can tune in and out the, the music uh, according to whether you're awake or not. Um, so they went on Kickstarter, they raised close to $2 million. And of course the audio also had to be right. So by partnering with Onkyo, they made sure of that. Uh, more recently we had another audio product called uh, Revels. Uh, this is earphones that are basically custom molded to your ears. Because if, if you have used earphones and you leave them you know, for some time, it gets a little bit painful. And sometimes it falls off and it's not comfortable. So they cr the best is custom molding, but it's really expensive. Normally it's like a thousand dollars pair uh, for a pair of, of earphones like this. Um, so what they've done is that they create a new technology, um, basically using a, a particular gel uh, that's very soft and that uh, is covered by a silicon sleeve and you can place it in your ear and then it's soft at that time and then you can use your phone to trigger the hardening process so it will fit perfectly to your ear, to the shape of your ear. So it looks like this. I uh, have a little animation there. Yeah, is it working? There you go. So put it in there and then shapes to your particular ear topography, and, uh, and then it stays there forever. I mean, uh, of course you can <laughs> take, take it out. Um, and same problem, I mean, they needed audio, they needed good audio, and uh, they partnered with Onkyo, went really well, and uh, they went also on Kickstarter, raised $2.5 million, and uh, even had uh, you know, some uh, offers for acquisitions almost uh, right off the bat. So that's, uh, those are kind of examples of uh, how, how things can go well, uh, working between startups and, uh, on, on large companies. But the large companies have to understand that they have to adapt the internal communication channels and support system to go at the speed of startups for this to work. So what next? Like a few ideas to, to think about for, for the future. Uh, so I mentioned this uh, uh, microcomputer. $9, depending on your business, could be 
actually an, a fraction or a rounding error of your cost of customer acquisition if you're selling like high value things. So you could almost imagine that this computer with some device around it doing something, you could actually give away. So it becomes so cheap that you could think we could enter an era of not just affordable computing, but disposable computing or free computing. Computer is $9, it's part of a smoothie. Um, so what could you do with free computing? So that's for you to think about, uh, depending on your business. Um, other thing is, what could you do with robot arms? Now that you can have a robot arm for the price of a laptop, you know, it could do all sorts of things. And then I showed some examples, uh, such as Zenso, and Dama, uh, and Minute. All those products could be tied with insurance. Your, your home insurer could give you this device for free, telling you if you install it, because now I can track all the risks of your house without invading your privacy, and you can also track that, and you can have an app so that you know what's going on. There's less risk for me as an intro. So I'll give you the device for free. I might, might even give you a discount on your insurance if you install it. And same for the, the health devices, like things that help prevent um, health conditions. Actually, prevention is the best form of medicine, right? So thinking about that, you could think, okay, well, what kind of devices could be used and how could we tie this up with insurance? Like we could even talk about insurance wear as, as potential future. So those are kind of the three ideas I wanted to part with and, uh, and I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you very much.